Imagine we took a small community of organisms and blew up that ecosystem to a planetary scale. How would the flora overgrow and claim the land given to it? How would the organism interact, develop or underdevelop? Most excitingly, who fills what niches and how are they filled? I decided to use a pond's ecosystem. None in particular, just the general idea of a pond that I had. I wanted to keep it somewhat simple so it isn't overcomplicated or repetitive of the niches that we already have. So the same as any other seed world, it's a planet with all the necessary qualities to sustain life, it's perfectly balanced, huzzah, hooray, woohoo. On this planet, there are a few species, all of which I imagine are your most common pond goers. This includes in the ponds and around. So ducks, fish, frogs, turtles, rabbits for spice, herons, diving beetles, dragonflies, flies, and pond skaters. As for the flora of this world, there are lily pads, algae, mosses, lichens, and an abundance of flowers, bulrushes, and I've even added some mangrove trees, but none too many. Think nipa palm and red mangrove. Obviously there are some grasses, and maybe one or two little trees, but the focus of this world is the pond ecosystem, not the grasslands. The pond seas are broken up into three types in terms of size. The small ponds we'll call beta ponds, the larger ones we'll call alpha ponds, and the gigantic ones we'll call gigaponds. There are numerous beta and alpha ponds, but there are only two gigaponds. They are named aloe and fisky. For no discernible reason, other than that they are discernible. There are a few biomes, all of which are derived from the swamp areas. I will dedicate videos to these biomes and their life in the future. Scattered vaguely are the general biomes. You know when in a movie there's background information about the world or a character, but it's not impactful in the grand scheme, yet it's still included anyway to make the world feel more lived in? That's what these biomes are. They exist, establish logic, but don't have major impacts on the goings-on of this world, yet their existence is still important. Let's start with a brief overview of the general biomes. The meadows are the largest biome. There are beautifully biodiverse areas of greenery and wetland, and some primitive forests exist here and there. They are largely flat land with ponds, and some bodies of water being the main interruption of terrain. The hills are the meadows if their altitude levels change drastically. Still, the inclines of the hills are gradual and gentle. The drylands are vast regions of savanna-like fronds and grasses, and fewer bodies of water. Open, and with little foliage to take shelter, organisms that live here must quickly adapt to hiding in plain sight. Obviously, wetlands form around prevailing bodies of water. These wetlands boast high biodiversity and form the highly varied category of what I'll call pond marshes, but ponds for short. These wetland derivatives cultivate slow, foraging lifestyles, but every now and again, a burst of action is needed. And yet, all three of these biomes are kinder than the colder ones. In the arctic regions of the planet, life freezes over. These points have irregular fluctuations in altitude, and to differentiate them from another similar environment, they'll be specified as the mountains. The other colder biome are the barrens, which are the intermediate area from the mountains to the rest of the world. They're basically just tundras, but with more water. In the water, near the shore, there are the shallows. It's just sand and water and little spits of rock. Bits of plants sit here and there, but nothing to ride home about. Still, many fish and invertebrates gather here, this area finds a lot of overcrowding, both in and out of the water. If the pond goes deeper, like that of the alpha ponds, a second region called the outcrops form. These are like the kelp forests in our oceans, but here it's diversified lily pads and freshwater plants. In the gigaponds, you find the final region, the open. Even lower than that is the abyss, in which deep sea life may evolve. Those are the biomes. All right. The first stage of this world's development is simply called the Age of Blossoming. I'll go over how each organism evolves roughly, and then in the next video I'll give the spotlight to specific ones. The rabbits are first to spread throughout the lands, dominating the meadows, the hills, and even some parts of the barrens, although they've yet to wander further into the cold. As they adjust to the world, their population steadies itself out. Over time, I imagine there are a few subspecies of rabbits that contend for survival. But this is the overarching species of rabbit. Gree rabbits. The gree rabbits, like earth rabbits, are obligate herbivores. And it is they who will become the planet's most prolific herbivore species. The herons are the first and only megafaunal obligate carnivore on the planet. Herons are actually known to snipe small animals like ducklings and rats. I imagine this behavior will be favorable in this ecosystem, as young rabbits litter the meadows, and ducks patrol the shallows. Some heron populations venture beyond their overcrowded ponds, and turn to more vulnerable prey. Some herons wait behind trees or circle the skies and ambush the rabbits. Others adopt a more terrestrial way of life. With no other predators, these terrestrial birds are allowed to grow unchecked. There are a few heron species that arise as a result, which I'm excited to discuss. The turtles, I'd argue, are the most segmented group. Many remain in the shallows, but with such undiscovered waters, many explore deeper, encouraging traits that breed for stronger swimmers, thereby adopting a truer, more turtlier form. 
Those who remain in the shallows fill a pseudo-crocodilian niche, laying and waiting beneath the waters and then rushing up at the prey that comes to drink, or ducks that swim above. Some opt for a more terrestrial way of life that is far removed from the waters, thus becoming the first major deviation from Tertullian lineage. Fewer predators mean these turtles can focus on mobility, so their shells start to loosen up, giving way to a branch of soft-shelled reptiles with larger forearms. The ducks are essentially the rabbits of the ponds, dominating the shallows, even venturing out into the expanse. The ducks are also the first of the two bird species to lay claim to the barrens, where they spec further into insulation. Unfortunately, this comes at the cost of flight, but once again, there are no predators in this region, so they can afford to do so. In another video, I want to focus on this population of ducks, who have travelled so far north that they are completely isolated from any of the major players, that they will develop their own specialised ecosystem that will remain uninterrupted for millennia. Fish undergo the largest diversification, originally looking like this, a little orf, unbound by the lack of barriers in the gigaponds. They can travel anywhere they want, spreading far beyond the shallows, integrating themselves in the lily pad forests of the outcrops, and even further. It's a fish-eat-fish -fish world out in the expansive blue, or brown-green, I suppose. They explode in size, structure, habitat, ecosystem, niche, and life. Almost every pond has a diverse and different fish life. The plants are small and infantile. Flowers, of course, do their flowery business and diversify, pollinate, and spread. There aren't any giant trees like ours, but instead mangrove pockets at some shores. The other trees are small but race to optimize on sunlight, eventually growing into bizarre forms, similar to, but still unlike our trees. They wind around one another, weaving up and down. No, this isn't just so I could make an inverted pun. I'm imagining the wind and weak soil aid in contorting the otherwise malleable tree trunks. Leaves race to cover surface area and give rise to wing trees, named so for their gigantic leaves that look as though they flap in the wind, but in the stillness they take in the rays of the ever-thinning sunlight. Lily pads evolve into undersea forests, and with the help of algae, form vegetative, coral-like forests. Bulrushes cover more and more wetlands, which serve as important filters for water quality. This massive, massive filtration system of plants forms part of the most important factors for the planet's notable green look. Following suit, much of the insects have also diversified. Diving beetles not only reach deeper levels, but also change in behavior as they fully adapt to a newer aquatic lifestyle, filling in a new age, crustacean-esque niche. Flies have diversified and found new modes of life, becoming pollinators, predators, shelled, and semi-terrestrial. Flies have really specked into many of the open niches and form the crux of the most insectivorous life. Pond skaters remain more or less the same. Dragonflies are the main invertebrate predator of the ponds and therefore grow much larger in size, even rivaling some of the smaller frog species. Speaking of, mosquitoes are forced to outmaneuver the frogs of the ponds, Obviously, with more land and still water than ever before, they venture into the meadows to feed on the rabbits. This is where the flies come into play, as they become more actively predatory, filling in the gaps of the dragonflies which occupy further regions. Many of the extinct species of this time come from the rise in mosquito swarms, who carry deadly diseases as well as general irritation. Mosquitoes inadvertently become a barrier for terrestrial organisms. Over time, but nowhere soon, their populations will steady out and become more manageable. Until then, regions of the pond marshes are scoured by mosquito clouds, which are impossible to maneuver in without being sucked dry. The frogs regulate the number of mosquitoes and flies that swarm the still ponds. Not many of them have ventured outside of the waterholes, as there's no pressure for them to. Yes, some fish are gigantic and prey on them, and herons will do so as well. But these are the type of environmental pressures which narrow down favorable traits, like speed or how long they could stay submerged, rather than massive shifts in evolutionary behavior, like migration. Until the dry era comes, frogs will dominate the inner ponds. A period of devastating storms lays waste to the land and sends many frog families of a nearby beta pond into the gigapond Fisky, and new types of frog evolve, ones that can withstand the harsh conditions of the gigapond. This focal species I'll simply call Fisky frogs for now, so suggest some names for them. That goes for any of these organisms, by the way. Alright, that about wraps up stage one of this Speciva project. We know the planet, the species, some niches, and the general direction that this will go. I'm excited. I'm going to release a few videos on this. That said, I don't aim to make a lengthy series, but I do want to continue doing some spec evo. So if you have an idea for a spec evo video, let me know, because there's a high likelihood that I'll see it. Those videos will be shorter though, because even though I've introduced myself as a speculative biology channel, I initially aimed to do more variegated things. So expect more of this, but also some of my really out of left field ideas. Also, I've yet to come up with a name for this world, so if you have any suggestions, let me know. Another thing I think could be fun is if you suggest some of your own Spec Evo ideas and I'll doodle them for some short episodes, maybe a minute or two at most. Think of me like a spring pad to bounce your ideas off of. You give me a suggestion, I draw it, add some input, and you take what you want and leave what you need. Until next time, 
Good evening and good night.